<laughs> and I've gone uh, old school. I've gone flashcards. Everybody else is doing something slightly different. Thanks, Kate. Um, so I'm from MOLA. I have a slightly vague job title of Head of Continuous Improvement, which basically means business improvement initiatives, including training. Um, so I've chosen to focus my kind of view of a sustainable future on skills. Um, and effectively, how can we use skills to ensure that our work remains impactful and relevant for different groups in a rapidly changing world? Future proofing is a very big topic, um, including things like advocating for our profession with policymakers, and that's more expertly discussed by others on the panel. So um, I'm looking more at a critical step we as a community can take, um, which is investing in training and skills so that we have what we need to carry out our work well, maximise the knowledge gained, um, and demonstrate the value of archaeology for years to come. Um, so as we know, there will be cultural, economic and technological changes um, for us to face in coming years. If we can anticipate those changes, identify the skills, knowledge and experience needed to adapt to them, and then take the opportunity to develop those things now, we won't find ourselves playing catch up when the time comes. Some skills needs will be dictated by worldwide trends in how work is done, as Rob was pointing out, technological innovation being the particularly key one. We need people who are adept at understanding and applying different technological solutions, but we also need a general level of digital literacy so that all of us can engage with these techniques. We also need to understand any shifts in priorities for our stakeholders so that we can continue to deliver work that resonates with different groups. Our skills have to ultimately adjust to what society considers to be important. I think the environmental sustainability and climate action agenda is a really good example of that. As Caroline was saying, we are a bit ahead of the curve, but there's still more that we can do to make sure that we all understand how our individual practice relates to that issue um, and how we can use our expertise to help um, contribute to it on a wider level. Commercial developers and funding bodies will also influence some of our skills um, as their perception, perceptions of value evolve. So archeological contractors are increasingly being asked how they're gonna generate social value through their work on redevelopment projects. That requires a really in-depth understanding of what social value is, which initiatives work particularly well and which don't. We need, then need to be able to really robustly evaluate success and communicate that back to the client. That's a set of skills we should be trying to develop as much as possible now. And finally, our own research agendas will dictate what skills we choose to focus on developing. For example, if we want to understand archeological and heritage crime, um, and raise awareness in local communities and help landowners take preventative action. Do we have those skills on a widespread basis now or is that something we should be investing in developing a bit more? There is a lot of work that goes into market intelligence and analysis and the more that we use this to proactively develop requisite skills on a widespread basis, the more prepared for the future we'll be. As well as diversifying our skills, we desperately need to ensure that the immense expertise that's held within our sector is maintained. It's no secret that supporting people's professional development has a huge impact on job satisfaction and career progression, and therefore retention. Research by IBM found that employees who don't feel that they're, being, that they're developing their skills are 12 times more likely to leave a company. If we just consistently lose skilled professionals, we're setting ourselves up for failure. There are other barriers to people progressing in their careers, but a lack of opportunity for learning and development is a really significant one. Upskilling, where someone learns additional skills which help them carry out their role more effectively or take on more responsibility, is fundamental to investing in people's professional development. And I would say, if we're honest, um, traditionally in archaeology, we tend to go for the baptism of fire approach um, or shadowing maybe but we are moving towards more structured learning. So for example, if you provide proper tr media training to a site supervisor, you as an employer can be more confident that they're gonna deliver a compelling and professional interview rather than relying on them to try and develop that skill on their own. And then the site supervisor feels more supported and invested in. But I also think there's expertise that's not being leveraged as effectively as it could be. Most archaeologists have extra skills that they just don't get to use in their daily role. If we can identify and unlock people's talents, we not only help them realise their full potential, 
we add to our organisational capacity without having to bear the cost of extra training for someone from scratch? These artefact illustrations were drawn by a Mola employee um, in their spare time. They've never received any training. They just have an innate artistic ability I'm immensely envious of. Um, but with some guidance, they could use that skill um, to progress within their career. We just need to think creatively about how to help them do that. Cross-skilling is slightly different to upskilling uh, in that it allows people to carry out activities which are unrelated to their role. And that can also help with future proofing. It gives us more flexibility, helps us weather the peaks and troughs in commercial work, for example, as people can be deployed to different areas of practice. If you have a fine specialist who's also trained to do some archiving or an environmental processor who's also trained to do geophysical survey, if there should be a lull in work in either of those areas, they can shift and adapt to another um, area. So in effect, having a kind of major and minor specialism like the American kind of university system. I think organisations do a lot of cross-skilling, but typically ad hoc. If we took a much more strategic and joined up approach to cross-skilling, I think we'd be an even more agile and resilient sector. Ideally, we'd look at things like training partnerships, Rather than each of us trying to address our skills gaps individually, we should make the most of our varied capabilities and deliver complementary training. And that's no more the case than between academic institutions and commercial units, where there's a huge amount of complementary skills filling in that we could do. And crucially, most people will fully embrace the opportunity to learn a new practice. PwC found that 77% of people are willing to learn a new skill or even completely retrain if it helps them progress in their career. But these opportunities have to be offered equitably. The same research found that half of workers feel that they've been overlooked for training opportunities because of their age, ethnicity, gender or social background. And that's just something we have to be constantly mindful of. In summary, kind of, I've focused a lot on building skills amongst existing practitioners, um, but widening participation in our professional practice can also help us future-proof our profession. Through citizen science, we increase interest and support for a subject, which helps preserve our place in society. We can ultimately create a network of very vocal archaeological ambassadors simply by giving people the opportunity to participate. Providing training in archaeological skills is something we're really fantastic at, but actually we should try and see it as more of a two-way process. Bringing people into our community who have different life experiences and different perspectives, helps diversify the skills that we have in our sector, but it also makes for better archaeology because we consider different ways of interpreting the past. We have new sector trainees at MOLA that come in, have been coming in for the last few years, and it never fails to impress me how much we can learn from them and actually take the opportunity to reflect on how we do things. So we have a former police officer who looks at collecting and assessing a different type of evidence differently to how we might, we have a former journalist who just builds out stories around interpretations differently. And we even had a former teacher who gave us some ideas on how we could improve our workbook exercises. The more we embrace the opportunity to think about how we could apply non-archaeological skills in archaeological situations, the more rounded our discipline will be. So ultimately, everything hinges on collaboration. All of us are kind of doing this work separately, but we need to take a sector-wide approach work together to share knowledge and resources, and consider how non-archaeologists can help us grow our, our own skills. And I think if we as a sector really invest in skills and widening participation, we'll be in a much stronger position to face whatever challenges the future holds. Thanks.